is so lovely to see you all again. Do you remember last time I told you all about Moses as a baby and how he was in the river and Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and then the long wait when he was in exile and how he came back and God brought those incredible plagues that decimated the Egyptian gods and then he broke the whole economy with his plagues and with the final plague he released us and how we were then chased by the Egyptian army as we crossed through the Red Sea that God made dry. And when we got onto the other side, the walls crashed down on their chariots, wiping out their military force. And they couldn't chase us. And Moses and I celebrated and we led the people in the most incredible dance of worship and praise because our God is the only God. He destroyed those gods of Egypt. He broke the economy of our oppressors and he freed us from their military might. They couldn't chase us. And the joy was unbelievable. We were so excited to go to the promised land until we started to go. Now, bear in mind, yes, we were slaves. We had a very hard life in, in Egypt, but we did have water always. And we had food, always. And we were sheltered in the Nile. Now we started the walk to Sinai. Moses said he was taking us back to Mount Sinai where God had spoken to him because he had promised God that he would take us there to worship him. So we went through the two wildernesses and we went via the, the on the south port, we went via the canal of Suez and it was hot. It was unbelievably hot. And our water ran out very quickly. And there were a lot of us. And we had livestock. And we had old people. And children. And pregnant women. And there was no water. And you would wake up in the morning with the red, red sunrise over the sand. And it would usher in a day of intense, burning heat with no respite. There are no trees in the Sinai. There's nowhere to sit and rest. When you sit, it's in the heat of the sun. And the sun is so bright and so intense over this endless world of sand, your eyes get sore from looking. And we walked and we walked. And by day three, we were so tired and so dehydrated. You start to vomit, empty, dry, heaving because your body is in distress. You're so thirsty that your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth and you can't, there's no spit left to swallow. And every step you take is costing you energy. And after three days of absolute drought and dryness and weariness, we saw date palms, and you know that means there's water there. And I was 80 years old, I was still a spring chicken, and I ran for that water. And there was manners were gone. I fell on my feet and I put my hands in and cut that water to my face and drank deeply. Whoa! It was revolting. It was bitter to the taste. There was an oily feel that stuck onto your skin. And as the people ran up, those of us who got there first said, don't drink it. It's bitter. It's horrible. It's, it's just, you can't drink this water. And the look of relief in their eyes changed to disappointment. And then as more people arrived, the disappointment changed to anger. And we people, we had to blame someone. So the people turned to Aaron and Moses. Why did you bring us into the wilderness to die? Here we have no water. You should have let us die in Egypt. We are going to die, all of us, from thirst. We cannot drink this water. And Moses went before God because the people were angry. And God told him to reach for a bush that was growing nearby and break off some of the wood so that the sap flowed. And as he threw it into the bitter water, it sank to the bottom. And he said, now drink. And he told us that God was testing us 
God was testing us to see if we would obey him and follow his commandments. And if we did so, and we obeyed his law, he would be our healing God and free us from all the diseases that, that the Egyptians had. And we drank the water. When you're desperate, you drink. And it wasn't very nice. It still had a sharp taste to it, but we could drink it. And those of us who, who really felt God had told us to drink this water, we drank deeply. Some drank as little as they could. You know what was amazing? That bitter water that we drank, it purged you. No details, but not pleasant in the desert. But we felt our stomach release from the discomfort from Egypt. The swelling and bloating was gone. And those of us who drank more, we had more energy. We felt more prepared for the next stage of the journey. And we went on. We didn't linger very long. We literally drank what we had to. And we left. And from there, we called that place Mara, which means bitter water. We left Mara. And we came to a place that Moses said was called Elam. And Elam was incredible. There were 12 wells of sweet water. 70 date palm trees that had shade that we could sit in. They had sweet date palms that we could eat. And so we lingered there a while. And when we moved from there, we were replenished. We stored water in our bags and we started to head out. And the journey back into the desert is even harder. For those of you who've had more than one child, you know you forget the childbirth until you're pregnant. That's how it felt. As we stepped back into those burning sands and you could feel the heat through your sandals and it would come over the top and burn the skin on your feet. We thought, all right, we can do this, but sure, this is hard. And we walked in that burning sun, carrying what we had because there was nobody to help you. And as we walked, the people started to complain. And they took their complaints to Moses. And they said to Moses, in Egypt, we had pots of meat. We had fruit. We had water. You have brought us here with our children to die of starvation. We cannot go on. And Moses again went before the Lord. And as an observer, I was thinking of all that God had done, of the, the plagues, of the Red Sea, such an awesome, powerful God, and yet we still will just turn to Moses. And Moses turned to the Lord. And we were at a place called the, the Wilderness of Sin. And at the Wilderness of Sin, God, in his gracious kindness, didn't say, look what I've already done. What he did was, he said to Moses and Aaron, gather the people. And tell them, I will make bread fall from heaven for you, and I will give you meat to eat, and you will see the glory of God in the sky, and you will know that I am your God. And that evening, we set up camp, all with our tents, and the throwing carpet cut down of heavy fabric across the frames. And quail started to come in. And the quail were so tired, they were falling out of the sky. You literally just bent down and picked them up. And quail are quite small bony birds. But my goodness, did they taste good. <laughs> they tasted so good. And the next morning, I opened that flap on my tent and I looked out and there was a little bit of dew. The dew was never enough to collect to drink, but it was there and the ground sparkled with it. And as the sun dried the dew, there were these flakes covering the ground. We'd never seen it before. 
Moses had traveled in the desert for 40 years. He'd never seen it before. And we went out picking it up saying, what is it? What is it? And we called it manna because that means, what is it? And Moses said to us, this is your bread from heaven. And God has said he will send this bread for you until we reach the promised land. But he also wanted us to learn some discipline, self-discipline. So we had to collect the manna every day. If you slept in a little bit late, you went hungry because the sun melted the manna and it disappeared. Some people thought they'd be clever and they collected enough for two days. So tomorrow we can sleep in. They woke up to putrid, maggot infested messes that they had to clean up and go hungry that day. For Moses had told us God's rules. He had said, every day, collect enough for your family. And we were very specific in how much you were to collect. And he said, never collect more than you need, except on the sixth day. On the sixth day, collect and make enough for two days, so that on the Sabbath you rest and honor God's rest. And you know, on those six days, we never got maggots, never went off. And it was also interesting. You had people like me, I'm busy, I like to do, and I would gather and gather and gather and gather and gather. And then I got some friends who were a bit like, yeah, I will get just enough. You know what was amazing? When we went to have that manner measured, we always had just enough. God's provision was profound. He blessed us every single day with manna. And people always say if they've never tasted it, what did it look like? It looked a bit like coriander seeds. And we would take them and you would grind it in between two stones. And then we would make a flat bread with it. And it had a slightly sweet taste to it. It wasn't bad. And do you know, for all the years we have walked this wilderness, not once has God failed to provide manna for us. Not once. He's a faithful, faithful God. And from there, the pillar moved and we moved with it. And Moses led us to a place called Rephidim. And when we got to Rephidim, give you one guess, the people complained. Mm -hmm. There was no water. And before you judge them too harshly, have you ever been that thirsty? That you actually would drink your own tears if you could produce any? That your skin is dry and cracking from the heat of the sun. Your lips are bleeding. You are so dehydrated. And we got there and the people complained. Why did you take us out of Egypt? We had the Nile. We had water in Egypt. You have brought us here to die with our children and our livestock. We are going to die in this desert. We would have been better off in Egypt. And Moses, who actually had a bit of a short temper, didn't show his temper. He went before God. And God said to him, Moses, that staff that you used to walk with, remember we used it to part the Red Sea and to, to cause all these incredible plagues? He said, take that staff and strike that rock over there where you see the black sediment going around it. Strike that rock. And Moses, the obedient servant, did exactly that. And out of that rock, poured the most beautiful water, enough for all the people, enough for the livestock. And we all could rest and drink. And so we camped near, near the Mount Horeb for a little while to replenish. While we were camped there, we were attacked by the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites were known, they were desert warriors. They were scavengers, they were bandits. They were descendants from Esau. And they killed for pleasure and profit. 
And they knew word gets out quickly in the desert. They knew we carried wealth from Egypt that the Egyptian neighbors had given us. And we would be a soft target, a slave nation, no weapons. But little did the Amalekites know mm -hmm. God was on our side. And when Moses saw them coming, he sent Joshua, one of the younger men out, to lead the fight. And he went up with Aaron and her up onto the top of the mountain. And from there, they could see the entire battle laid out. And every time Moses raised his hand in worship to Yahweh, our people won. But when he grew weary and took his hands down, the Amalekites gained ground. So his wonderful men who were with him, his brother and his friend got a stone for him to sit on. And the two of them stood beside him and raised, their, uh, raised his arms themselves the whole day until sunset. And at sunset, the Amalekites were defeated. And God told Moses that for them attacking his people at this vulnerable time, they would be enemies for the rest of their generations. And that proves to be true. While we were still there, we also had a lovely occurrence. We had a family reunion. Well, for Moses, I got to meet my nephews for the first time. And my sister-in-law, Sephora, and her father, Jethro, came from Midian to see us. And it was lovely to hear the stories of how, how Moses had met his wife at a well when he was fleeing Egypt, when he'd killed that Egyptian guard for, for hurting a Hebrew slave and then fled for his life. He'd come to a well and there she was with her sisters gathering water. And they giggled and gone back and told their father what had happened, how the other shepherds hadn't let them near the water. Now your sheep will die, your livestock die if you can't draw water. And it's a hard job. And then up stood Moses. Moses, the Egyptian soldier. And I think he might have had some of his anger issues going on because he chased all those shepherds away. And then he helped these women collect their water. And when Jethro had heard, he sent them back. He said, how rude of you. There's an incredible hospitality in the desert. And he sent the girls back to bring them in. And Moses came in and he had a meal with them, which is desert hospitality. And he told the poor Elisha that she caught his eye as she sat grinding the bread to make for his meal. And he stayed and he worked for Jethro. And Jethro was a man of incredible experience, gave him huge knowledge about the desert and gave him his daughter in marriage. And now I got to meet them and the two sons. So while we were bonding over history and she was telling me stupid things Moses had done like sisters like to hear, Moses took Jethro to the side and told him how incredible God had been to the people told Jethro how since he'd been released from Jethro's work, how he'd approached Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and how God had taken that hard heart of Pharaoh and used it to show each and every Egyptian and Israelite that their gods had no power. They were just man-made nothings. He'd used it to break the economy of Egypt and to break their military force so they couldn't chase after us. And Jethro was amazed. He was so delighted. And do you know what he did, that Midian man? He sacrificed on an altar to God and declared that our God is the only God, better than any other God that they could imagine. And it was an incredible time because afterwards we could take the meat and we feasted together as a family. And it was incredibly precious and special. And I will never forget that reunion at Mount Horeb. But then the cloud moved again. So it was time for us to move on. And it was time for us to get to this mountain where Moses had first seen the burning bush and heard the voice of the Lord. And so we followed across another long wilderness and camped at the foot of this mountain. 
And this is a part that, as a people, we messed up. As leaders, we missed the mark rather badly. For while we were at the mountain, God spoke to Moses and he said that he would speak to the people. And when we were at the base of the mountain, this cloud descended over the entire mountain. And when Moses spoke to God, we heard the very voice of God from in that cloud. I can't begin to describe it. It was the most awe-inspiring, reverentially frightening thing I have ever experienced. And we were told not to touch the mountain. I don't think we wanted to. But we were so frightened that as a people we said, we don't want to hear this. We don't want to hear from God ourselves. Can he filter it through Moses? Moses is used to hearing God. This is too much for us. We are frightened to death. Let Moses hear for us and bring us the word. And God told Moses to tell us that he wanted to make a covenant with us. These Hebrew slaves, this rabble of complaining, stiff-necked people, he wanted to offer us a covenant. And all we had to do was obey him. And he would make us a nation of priests, a holy nation, a people peculiar to God alone. And we said, yes. Wouldn't you say yes? An offer from God to a people? And he told Moses to come up the mountain and the cloud settled right on the top with lightning and thunder and fire. So Moses took Joshua and they went up the mountain. And it's a steep climb for an old man in his 80s, but he went. And he left Aaron, our brother, and her in charge. Just to manage and judge the people and maintain law and order while he was away. And people are fickle. We have such short memories. Because while still gathering the manna that God provided every morning, when Moses didn't come back down very quickly, the people started to ask, where is God? Where is Moses? And maybe they thought that God had consumed him in the fire. Maybe they thought he'd run away, tired of their complaining and moaning and aggression. But they said, we want a God we can see. We want a God we can worship here. And Aaron was not a good choice of leaders. As his sister, I can tell you, people pleaser of note. <laughs> so instead of saying to them, no, look at the manna that is in your mouth. He said, bring your gold, bring your jewelry and cast it to me. And Aaron, who had stood before Pharaoh, took that gold and he melted it down and he cast it and he worked it into a golden calf. And the people were thrilled. Please don't judge us too harshly. This was what we had known for 400 years. We lived in a community where when you needed something, you turned to something visible that you had made to ask. And Aaron held it up and he said, this is the God who has brought you out of Egypt. And the people were pleased. And that pleased the people pleaser. So he said, let's have a celebration day tomorrow. And the next morning, most of the people in the camp got up and they sacrificed precious livestock to this thing Aaron had made. And then they feasted. And then it got totally out of hand. They started to behave like it was a pagan ritual with immoral acts and obscenity. And this was 39, 40 days since they had promised to obey God. When Moses had stood on the mount, he had said the Ten Commandments God gave. You must know them. 
you will have no graven image before you. You will worship the Lord your God alone. You will not commit adultery. You know the ten. They've broken the first two straight away, and many more with the way they were behaving. And amidst all of this, God spoke to Moses on the mountain and told him what the people were doing. And Moses hurried down to where Joshua waited. And they came down and Joshua said, it sounds like there's a battle. Have the Amalekites come back? What is going on? And Moses shook his head. In his hands, he was carrying stone tablets that the very hand of God had written laws on to govern us so that we would know how to become this incredible nation of God that would bless the rest of the world. And when Moses came down and saw that calf, and he saw how the people were behaving. He smashed them to the ground. And the sound it made was unearthly. And it cut through the sound of revelry. And the people were silent. Suddenly the idea of a calf and sacrifice and immoral acts didn't seem like such a good idea with the broken tablets and Moses prophet of God standing before them. And then Moses got angry. He took that calf and melted it down. And then he ground it into a fine powder and he took the powder and he threw it across our drinking water so that we would have to drink that gold and it would now be impure and you'd never be able to redeem it or make it into another idol. And then he turned to Aaron because leaders are accountable. Why did you lead the people into the sin? And Aaron was almost flippant. He was like, if you know these people, they're stiff-necked and obstinate, and, um, and they gave me the gold. I just threw it in the fire, and out came this conf. Like a blatant lie. We all watched him melt it and work it into a car. And you know, it was one of the most sobering moments of our lives. We stood there with our sin so obvious, our heart condition before God on display. We had broken the covenant that God had made with us not even eight weeks before. We broke it. And Moses said he would go before God and plead for us. And he did. And he pleaded for God. You know, God even suggested that maybe he should just wipe these people out and start again with Moses. Because obviously these genes are flawed. But Moses said that he would wipe them out too. Because he as their leader is culpable. And he has led them from Egypt and would lead them to the promised land just like God had promised. And God honors his word. So he said he would not wipe out the people. But when all this was going down, he did call for accountability of the instigators, the people who had started it, the people who had pushed the weaker ones towards this golden calf. And he called for those who stand for the Lord, come stand beside me. And he told them to get their swords. And they went through the camp, brother against brother, father against son. And 3,000 people were slain. Because their heart intent was so impure, they had to be removed from the community. And it should have been all of us. That's the penalty for breaking covenant, is death. So God's grace was extended to us yet again. And while we'd been camped there, Moses had had a tent put up on the side, just outside of the camp. And it was called the Tent of Meeting. And it was there that Moses would go and speak to God. And from now, when he went to speak to God in the Tent of Meeting, the pillar of cloud would come down and rest over the tent. And do you know, as he walked towards that tent, 
every person got out of their tents and stood at their entrance and worshipped God until Moses returned with words for us. And Moses was asking God, how do I lead this people? How do I turn a nation of slaves into a nation of priests? I can't do this. This is hard. And God was giving him his law. And he told Moses to carve out more stone tablets and take them back up onto the mountain. And this time Moses would have to carve them out for us. And so Moses did. And the laws were many. But he was trying to teach us discipline. And the laws were geared around respect. Respect and honor for God. Respect and honor for self. Respect and honor for each other. Even the foreigners in our midst. And as the laws were coming through, Moses was, was teaching and judging and guiding. And it was an incredible experience. And one of the things that God asked for, and I think it was because as people we needed something visual, he asked Moses to build a tabernacle. And the tabernacle would be a place which we could associate with God's very presence. And its design was very specific and very symbolic. And inside in the most deep part would be the Holy of Holies. And it was in here that the beautiful Ark of the Covenant made from gold and carrying the memories of what God had done for our people would be kept. And we didn't have the skill to make this tabernacle. We had no skilled people. We were slaves. And God anointed people's hands to be able to make the tabernacle according to his calling. And once it was complete, that pillar of cloud that we had followed all these days settled over the tabernacle. And at night, <coughs> the fire appeared inside of the cloud, showing us God's presence was always accessible. God's presence was amongst us. We were truly his people. And his laws were designed so that we would be different from every other nation. When Aaron let the people run wild like that, the other nations laughed at us. They became a laughing stock. The people that God had rescued with displays of power and might to behave like pagans. And God saw he couldn't do it alone, so he showed us how. He wanted us to be marked different from our culture in everything. The way we ate, the way we dressed, the way we treated each other and others, the way we treated lawbreakers, and most important, how we worshipped our holy thing. And we did not move unless that cloud lifted from the tabernacle. Then we would move on and follow. And from there, the cloud one day started to lift. And Moses asked Jethro to come with us, which I was really glad because he really does know the desert like nobody else. And we went to a place called the Desert of P P P Pathan. And at the Pathan Desert, we set up camp. And can you believe with all that had happened, with the tabernacle there, with, with everything that had happened, people started to complain again. And they started to complain and hunger for the things of Egypt. They wanted melons, they wanted fish, they wanted onions and garlic. They were bored with the Lord's provision of manna that gave you everything you needed. And God got angry. Fires broke out on the outskirts of the camps. And then they complained more. Moses had to intercede. He had to ask God to put the fires out as they consumed these people. And then they complained more. And what happened was we still had Egyptians with us who had escaped and fled Egypt with us, sympathizers. But they hungered for Egypt more than us. 
and they incited people. And the more they moaned, the more we listened. And the more we listened, the more we agreed. And the more we agreed, the more we lusted after the past. And to let you know why God got so angry, each of those things they hungered for were part of worship of the gods he had destroyed before their eyes. The fish, the onions, the garlic, the melons were used in sacrificial worship to gods he had destroyed. And here they, God, provided them with manna and they looked back. And God was angry. The Lord was righteously angry. And he said to Moses, I will give them meat enough that they'll eat so much they'll die. And Moses, very practically, was, where are you going to get all this meat from? Like, even if we kill all the livestock and we go fishing, we're never going to have enough. And God said to him, do you think my arm is too short? And God provided a wind blew up and blew quail in from the sea. There were so many quail that they piled up a day's walk in any direction from the camp. And the people collected them and started to cook them and eat them. But those whose hearts longed for Egypt, those whose hearts hungered for those pagan gods, died. And from there, we went to Azeroth. And at Azeroth, for all my ability to prophesy, my worship, my leadership, I fell so hard. And I try so hard to remember what I was thinking at the time. It started because I think I was envious of Moses. He spoke to God face to face. God gave the law through Moses. God allowed Moses to plead for the people. Maybe, maybe I was a bit resentful because Aaron was never punished for what he did. He allowed the people that sacrifice. He made the calf and yet he wasn't punished. And I think pride stood up and said, I'm better than that. And maybe arrogance, if I'm honest. But I started to say to Aaron, and always not being honest with Aaron and myself then, you know, should Moses be the leader? He's got a Cushite wife. She's not even a Hebrew. And you know, he grew up in Pharaoh's palace. We suffered with the slaves. We know their pain. But I didn't only say it to Aaron. I started to speak to people. And I started to speak to lots of people. Grumbling, moaning, inciting them to think less of the leader that God had appointed. And you know, Moses was the most humble man. He didn't even confront him. He didn't say, hey, big sister. Shh. But God did. God heard my grumbling in the tents, at the water, he heard, and he called for Aaron and Moses and myself to go to the entrance of the tent, and the cloud came down, and God said, when I speak, it is with vision and dreams to my prophets. But not so with my faithful servant Moses. With Moses I speak as a friend face to face. Moses sees my very form and you weren't afraid to question him? My heart felt like a stone in my chest. I was so filled with fear at the voice of God. And I felt something change. And as that cloud lifted, I looked down and my hands, my arms were covered with a white skin disease, a rotten skin disease that was a death sentence. And when Aaron looked at me, he turned to Moses and he said, well, please, Moses, help us. Please don't let this happen. Please, Moses. And Moses, who had every right to be indignant and go, yep, you deserve that. 
He prayed to God. Say, please, grace and mercy. And God said, it's as if she has so much contempt for me. And if a father should spit on his daughter in contempt, she has to leave the camp for seven days. So at the least, Miriam, you leave the tent and the camps, live in isolation for seven days until your skin is clean. And you know, seven days doesn't sound like long, but when you're alone, in pain, with pieces of your body rotting, and you know that that is simply a symbol of the rot that was inside your soul. And you examine your thoughts and your motives. And you think about your actions and your words. And you're so convicted by what you have done. And bless them, the people did not move until I was healed. And I came back into the camp with no marks, but one or two scars, a very different woman. I came back humbled. I came back more honest with myself. I came back with respect for Moses as God's chosen leader and all of God's grace and mercy. And today when I look at my hands, you can see there's a mark here and there from that time. And it reminds me of a holy God a God of judgment. But then I look at my smooth face in between and I'm reminded of a forgiving and merciful God who you have access to today. And my word to you is please don't grumble and moan. The price is high. It rots the inside of your soul. When you are unhappy, disillusioned, disappointed, and we all get there, Take it to God in prayer. Don't grumble to me. It is God who is your provider. God who is your healer. God who is the almighty one who loves you. Thank you.